All right. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of uh, today, 21st of January. We are having the third webinar of 2021 together with Sebastian from Heriot Watt. Uh, I am myself pleased to host you all. Uh, today we have the pleasure and honor to host Professor David White uh, from Harvard University. Um, David would not need any introduction, but I still, out of courtesy and respect, I'll read a few lines about him. Uh, Dave uh, received his PhD in physics from Harvard University, uh, coming originally from uh, Canada, the University of Waterloo, and then joined Exxon, a research and engineering company, where he worked for nearly about 18 years there. Then he became a professor of physics at the University of Pennsylvania and then finally moved to Harvard at the end of the last millennium as professor of physics and applied physics. He leads a group studying research group studying soft matter science with a focus on materials science, biophysics, microfluidics and flow in porous media. He has served as the co-director of the BASF Advanced Research Initiative at Harvard co-director of the Harvard Kavli Institute for Bio Nanoscience and Technology, and also served as director of the Harvard Materials Research Science and Engineering Center. Actually, we just were speaking with him. He just also recently published uh, another book on science and cooking, physics meets food. And so this is quite an, a very, very interesting subject also for scientists to to get science into their daily life as well. Uh, so several startup companies have come from his research lab uh, to commercialize research concept and provide it to the society, to serve the society for good. Uh, his Google Scholar page lists most of his publications, books, uh, citations exceed 115,000. Uh, so it's quite uh, an impactful and um, contributive as scientists in the field, in the diverse field of physics, and especially also porous media. Uh, please do visit the page and, and study his, his work. It's our pleasure and honor once more, Dave, to have you here with us. Thank you for graciously accepting this uh, webinar for good cause to combat work from home isolation. Many colleagues and friends are happy now to see you live. Uh, so to the audience please know dave's uh, lecture would last for about uh, half an hour followed by questions and discussions like always please do type your questions in the chat box sebastian would go through them as much as time allows and then uh, finally we will uh, have the lively hopefully uh, discussion session at, at the end as well so without any uh, further ado the stage uh, is all yours dave uh, please we are looking forward to hearing your lecture and thanks once more Okay, Hadi, it's uh, really a pleasure and an honor, and thank you all for listening. Uh, I sort of like the date. It's one twenty one twenty one. I like that <laughs> date. This is uh, nice. Yes, uh, and um, uh, thank you for uh, joining us. Um, let's see. Today I'm going to talk about work that's really uh, the work of many people who've been in my research lab uh, for a number of years, uh, over the past few years. Uh, Shima Parsa uh, did a lot of the uh, first part of the work I'm going to do. Uh, she's now at uh, Rochester, uh, but that was all set up by Sujit and Amber, Amber who were postdoc and student in the lab. Um, a lot of the more recent work is done with uh, Tomas Kochard, uh, some of the fracking, which I hope I'll get to. And Ahmed and Ariel uh, really have done some instrumental simulations for us. And all of this is done in collaboration with uh, Li Jia Zhao, uh, with whom we have a joint laboratory. He's at the uh, uh, Chinese University of Petroleum in Beijing. Okay, so let's see. Uh, you know, back when I was uh, trying to uh, do uh, research at Exxon, uh, this is uh, what we would look at, uh, cores. This is what a core looks like. It's got some oil in it. Um, obviously, it's very uh, valuable. You learn a great deal about it, but it's absolutely impossible to see inside of it. Now, Recently, uh, MRI uh, imaging and uh, computer-aided tomography, those kind of imaging are getting very, very good at this, but still you're limited by what you can see in the dynamics in particular. But even then, we knew there was a problem. And so here's a paper that I published uh, 
with my colleague Jim Stokes, who I think just retired from uh, Exxon. Um, it was published in 1986, notice. And we were trying to do uh, something uh, that allowed us to go beyond what you do with a, uh, with a uh, core, but use still a model system. And we use a, a, a model system of sintered glass beads as the porous medium. This was actually not our real invention. It was invented in Ridgefield where Schlumberger had their lab. And so we all called it Ridgefield Sandstone, except since Jim made it, we called it Stokeside at Exxon. And this was uh, something you can see we did some uh, nice, uh, we, we, we could do some nice physics. The problem was you still couldn't see inside of it. You could only see the outside of it. So you only saw essentially a two dimensional type of behavior. And I would venture to say that this had no real impact on uh, technology. Um, and one of the problems with that, if you look inside of Stokesite, here's a, just a model of it, but here's the actual sample here. And here it's blown up. And you see, you can't really see through it because there are too many interfaces. There's too much scattering of light. So you can't use optics, even though with glass, you're trying to do it with optics. And this is a problem that in those days we really never solved. And that was probably one of the reasons for the limitation it had on, on technology. Um, but fortunately, uh, Amber came along and she didn't have this background. She didn't know all these details. She said, well, we just have to see inside of it. We don't need to use the standard fluids. We don't need to use water. We don't need to use oil. We need to use a polar wetting fluid and a non-polar non-wetting fluid. So she just uh, in, uh, mixed together some polar fluids. And here you're looking through Stokesite, but you're seeing it with, with it filled with the polar fluid and you can see right through it. Similarly, with the oil phase, you can see right through it. So you can take two fluids and you can perfectly match the index of refraction of each of the fluid to the glass and therefore to each other. Now you can see right through the medium and you can use optical techniques to study the behavior. So here's an example. What we do is we use confocal microscopy. We literally take slices, optical slices, and go in three dimensions, take a, a collection of three dimensional uh, slices. We put dye in the fluid so we can see where they are. Here's a case where we've dyed the water and the black regions here are the beads and we can reconstruct the, uh, the whole geometry of the beads. We can put uh, dye in each of the fluids and we can study now the image. We can image in three dimensions uh, in real time using optical techniques. We can image both fluids in this porous medium. So here's an example. This is what it looks like in the lab. Now, of course, our main tool is this confocal mic microscope. Uh, the sample is here. It's connected to the real world with some pumps. Uh, but it's all a very simple and very standard experiment that we can do um, uh, routinely, essentially on this desktop or on this microscope. And so here's an example of what we would see. This is an example of the image of one of the regions. This is the field of view. This is probably a few hundred microns square, but we can piece together the whole image and see the whole porous medium. And this is what you would see. Again, what we're doing here was we're putting a dye in the uh, water, we flooded it with water. And you can see the dark spots here, all these dark spots, these circles are beads. We can take this, we can take the whole image if we want, we can collect the image in all three dimensions and reconstruct the whole image. Uh, typically what we'll do and what I'll show you is we'll take slices and we won't look in the third dim dimension unless we really need to, but we will be in the middle of the sample, not on the edge, but in the middle of the sample. So we'll be seeing a slice and a three, true three-dimensional behavior. And so this is the typical uh, dimensions. It's something, our, our samples are something of the order of a centimeter uh, or several centimeters typically uh, long and some fraction of a centimeter wide and high. And this is what we see. Now I'm gonna show you uh, in real time the invasion of the sample by oil. That is that we're pushing oil into the sample, the oil is a non-wetting fluid, and this is what it looks like. 
It's filled with water. You see we're pushing the oil. The dark regions here that you see are the oil. And you can see they're being held up and then they're breaking through exactly what you would expect to see, the kind of dynamics you would expect to see. This is what you might call invasion percolation. It's exactly the sort of thing that you can see. And you can see this in real time. In fact, if you look over a larger uh, field of view, this is again taking a single slice, but over the whole sample, this is what it looks like over time. You see that you get invasion and the oil fills the, uh, the medium. You can do the same thing uh, uh, when you uh, do the water flood afterwards. So you invade with the fluid, then you um, inject water. Uh, this is now imbibition because you're putting water in it's the wetting fluid. And this is what it looks like over a course of time. You can see you push out the oil, you have some residual oil. You can study this, you can study the dynamics, and you can go back and look and see exactly what you have. Say the residual oil, you can see exactly what you have, the dynamics, you can see exactly what's left over for a given capillary number. For example, this is a ganglion that's left over. This is one blob of trapped oil. So I'll go back here um, and this is after everything's uh, uh, been, uh, um, all the, the water flood is completed. Uh, you're static and you see these ganglia, they look like this. You can see this is the, this is the scale of a pore here. So you can see that you're seeing uh, ganglia that extend over many, many pores, uh, many, many particles, um, and they're connected together. You can reconstruct this, you can look in three dimensions and you can start to ask questions, why is it being trapped? How do you understand the trapping? And of course, the trapping is relative, relatively simple, but you can go and you can validate the simple physics that you know must be happening. This is the non-wetting fluid, so it's trapped by capillary forces. You can see the capillary force. You can measure the curvature of the interfaces. You can calculate the capillary pressure that's holding it back, and you can measure its size, and you can determine what the uh, viscous pressure that's trying to drive the fluid. Now, how do you get the viscous pressure? The viscous pressure, of course, depends on the uh, viscosity of the uh, oil, of the water, the displacing phase, and the velocity. You can calculate the average velocity using uh, Darcy's law, uh, measuring a permeability. You can do that, but actually what you also can do, and even more importantly, I'll show you, you can actually measure the velocity and determine what the viscous drop are. And so you see this kind of behavior that, um, uh, that uh, you get uh, the, the, the size of the blobs are large enough so that their uh, capillary forces just overcome the viscous forces. The viscous forces, of course, depend on the uh, pressure drop from here to here and the velocity and uh, just from a sort of a Darcy uh, uh, treatment. So you know that the larger they are, the larger the pressure drop is, and uh, eventually uh, they get small enough that the capillary forces hold them in place. You can see all of this, you can measure it, you can understand the fundamental physics in a very uh, elegant way. We can do something else, we can seed this is where we're just flowing water. We can seed small particles in the water, and you can see the motion of the particles. So you actually watch the particles move as the fluid flows through the pores. And now you can measure the velocity. All you have to do is take images, subsequent images, uh, sequential images of these things, and measure the displacement of the particles. You do this, of course, with a more formal uh, way. You do a particle image velocimetry. And you can do that and actually measure the velocity. And so you can measure, this is measuring in a slice right here, measuring the uh, flow of the particles. You can get the velocities in that slice. Uh, it looks like this. Here's just a, a heat map showing the different velocities. This is normalized by the, uh, by the Darcy velocity, but here are the different uh, uh, velocities. You can see here where the, part, where the beads are, the porous medium, there's no flow. You can see the average flow. Some places it's pretty close to zero. Other places it's pretty fast. There's a distribution of velocity. So this is an important thing. Although with if you use any standard treatment of understanding the velocity, such as Darcy's law, that's a mean field treatment. You only get a mean field value. 
Now you can go and measure the local velocities directly and you can see the distribution of velocities. You can see the heterogeneity in the velocities. You can see the correlation, the spatial correlation. Look, there's a fast region right here. You can see all of that just directly with your imaging. So this is what the profile looks like. This is looking over the whole sample. Uh, you can see some uh, uh, regions where there's a faster regions, some slower regions. But now you can do much more because now you can do uh, an experiment before and after you uh, inject oil and then you uh, do a, an oil recovery, you have the residual oil. This is the ex example where you have residual oil. And again, you can see the velocity distribution in this case. And uh, obviously the velocities have changed. There's regions here where there's trapped oil. Uh, in general, the velocities are larger, but there's a broader distribution of the velocities. And you can measure that. You can determine what the distribution of velocities are. So here's a plot of the, um, of the uh, velocity. This is the uh, uh, velocity. It's actually the speed. So it's just a positive and negative value. It's the speed in the longitudinal direction along the imposed flow. This is the speed uh, normal to the imposed flow. You, because of the disorder, you have a flow that goes uh, not only in the same direction, but in, in the opposite direction. And you can see the distribution. Interestingly, these are plotted on semi-log plots. The distributions are best described as exponential, not as Gaussian. They're not Gaussian distributions, they're exponential distributions. Um, you can model this. Uh, you can use some kind of mean field. We do this all the time. Basically, you can model it as a series of tubes. If you want to get the full two-dimensional or three-dimensional effect, you can use a, 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 an array of tubes in different direction. You're, in some sense, imagining that the throats or the throat and the pore are modeled by a, a tube, and you can allow the tube or you can calculate the velocity through the tube uh, as Poisson flow. And this is just a way of modeling, again, the mean field and getting some distribution of that. And you can see that you can get a reasonable distribution and a reasonable agreement with the kind of... Uh, the data that we uh, that we observe. You can ask other questions. One of the things that always puzzled me uh, when when we did the experiments when, back when I worked at Exxon was what does it mean when you have two phase flow when you're measuring relative permeabilities? Then obviously the relative uh, uh, volume fraction of each of the fluids are important, but also the flow rates of each of the fluids are important. And when you do relative permeability. You, 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 what you do is you have two fluids flowing at the same time. So you have a simultaneous flow of both fluids, and you want to understand something about the permeability of the flow of each phase. So let's ask, how can we understand it? For example, if we plot it as the velocity, let's do it in terms of capillary number, of the velocity of the water here and the oil here, we plot the uh, flow as one, time, one type versus another as we say we fix the velocity of oil and we change the velocity of water, how do we see, what do we see the nature of the flow of the oil and the water as we increase the, the water flow? So we can go and look at it. And now if we do the first experiment where we have both of them flowing, but at a very, very, very low flow rate, you can see that the water is flowing about 10 times the, uh, the, the speed of the oil, but both of them are flowing uh, slowly. This is actually a movie. This is real time. And if you look very carefully, you see some little fluctuations, but there's no change in what happened. So remember, what I've done is I've filled the medium with a certain volume fraction of oil. I've pushed out enough oil that the water is at what you would call breakthrough. The oil is still being recovered. I'm injecting both of them. So I'm collecting both oil and water at at the collection, I'm injecting here, and I see a static pattern. Maybe if I look over long times, it will change, but I see a static pattern. So both the oil and the water must have interconnected or connected regions going from one side to the other because oil is being transported through the medium and water is being transported through the medium, but I see the pattern in the porous medium looking exactly the same. However, now if I increase the flow of the water, now I go much a higher flow of the water. Now the flow of the water, the viscous flow of the water is sufficient to break up 
those ganglia are those blobs of oil. And so now you see the transport of oil being very different. If you watch in real time, you can see that there's blobs of oil that are getting transported as blobs. They're disconnected. You no longer have a connected region, but instead the oil is being pulled through the a medium by the water because we're injecting both of them at some rate, but the water flow is fast enough, the capillary number is high enough to overcome the um, capillary pressure and push the blobs and make them flow. And so you can see some characteristic value of the capillary number of the water where the blobs break up and they no longer remain connected, but rather the viscous pressure is sufficient to drive them and make them flow. And now you can do the same experiment where you vary the capillary number of the oil and look what happens and ask what, what do you see. And again, you see at very low flow rates, the uh, uh, system will remain connected. But as you, as you go to higher flow rates of oil also, then the, there's so much oil in there that it no longer flows in a continuous manner, but it's again broken up and flows in a, uh, a broken up manner. And so we can plot the region where you get connected flow and the region where you get broken up flow. And you see that there's a region here. This is sort of like a phase or a state diagram. In this case, it's all broken up. There's, there's not continuous flow. At the lower capillary numbers, there are continuous flow. And roughly speaking, there's some critical capillary number. And if you just take the sum of the capillary numbers, normalized by that critical capillary number here, when that's equal to one, roughly speaking, this is this line here, you see this uh, transition uh, between the uh, different types of flow. And this is something that you can measure directly. So now you can go back in, and this solves for me one of the big puzzles that I had. What was the nature of the flow? When you do relative permeability measurements, which you do all the time with cores, you have no idea really what the nature, the structure of the flow is. Now, using this model, you can go in and you can look directly and see what the structure of the flow is. Another thing that we've tried to address is uh, something that's actually uh, one of the very few, uh, well, right now, uh, I guess all uh, enhanced oil recovery uh, methods are not uh, really that uh, valuable, was given the price of oil. But, you know, the price of oil, at least in my experience, uh, it changes, it will eventually go back up and uh, one of the few commercially viable uh, forms of uh, enhanced oil recovery is polymer enhanced oil recovery. And we wanted to ask, can we understand something about the nature, the un underlying physics of polymer enhanced oil recovery? And the point about this is the reason you use uh, polymer enhanced oil recovery, the lore in the field, the why everybody who does polymer enhanced oil recovery says that they do it, is that you want to get a stability of the displacement. So here's uh, just a visualization where we've taken the ratio of the mobilities, that is, we've taken the viscosities in this case, since the porous medium is the same, we've uh, taken the viscosity of the fluid, the, the two fluids the same. And you can see here that you get a stable interface, that the uh, displacement of the displacing fluid, which is the white fluid, uh, is stable as it displaces the oil. More typically, there's a big uh, mismatch between the viscosities. And so if the uh, viscosity ratio is, is such that you're putting a very low vis viscosity fluid, you're trying to displace a highly viscous fluid, you get viscous fingering. Again, it's a well-known effect. And this leads to very large amounts of residual oil. So to overcome that, the lore in the field is that you add polymer, you increase the mobility, you bring the mobility up to uh, up to as close to one as you get, and you get the stable uh, front as you push the as you displace the oil. Uh, it's just by adding polymer, and this is uh, a, actually a, a viable way of doing things. It, it, it works um, quite well. It works. It's commercial even for for international companies. Uh, for national companies, it's often used. Uh, it's very widely used, for example, in China. The problem is that uh, because of the expense of polymer, what you typically do, certainly the international companies, they use a slug of polymer. That is, you put a slug of uh, polymer solution and you follow it just by a chase water. And the real problem in understanding this is that 
this works. You think that you're you're uh, improving the mobility ratio, but it works even for very very viscous oils where you can't get close to improving the, the mobility ratio to one. So it doesn't seem like you're really doing that much because you're not improving it that much. Moreover, what you find is that a lot of the recovery is not when you're using the polymer, but it comes when you're putting the chase water through. Quite a bit after you you put uh, you know some fraction of a pore volume of a slug of, of polymer through, and then many pore volumes of chase water, and that's where you get a lot of the recovery. So we set about to try about trying to understand this. Uh, we were working actually with uh, Enrique and, and Total, and we used uh, some of the Total oil, and we also used a really a commercial polymer. And now we can't see as easily through the, the medium, but nevertheless, using the focal microscope, we can see some things. We measured exactly what came out of the medium. So we did a very careful study. Here you can see that um, we, we now we have phases that we can only see if there's oil, it blocks what we can see on top. So you can see, for example, here the magenta is oil. And on top of that, the next layer, if we look in the confocal, you just see a shadow. You don't see anything because the light is blocked by the oil. Nevertheless, you can try to reconstruct and see what's going, going on with the system. And Shima did some very, very careful uh, experiments. First, for example, this is just showing the effect of a polymer uh, enhanced oil recovery uh, in a porous medium. She uh, 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 injected uh, water and she got breakthrough. She would recovered something like 27% of the oil. Then she did a poly polymer flood. She gets no additional recovery. Then she does it, follows it with the chase water, and now she gets 17% more recovery. So she recovers 17 more percent of the oil in place during the chase water. So how can we understand this? The problem is it just doesn't make sense. The, the, um, the uh, capillary pressure that is holding the oil back is something like 3,600 pascal, the viscous pressure in this case is about 125 pascals. How can we understand what's going on? Uh, so we took, uh, we, we did some studies just using the, the polymer itself. Um, and this is the important thing. We did a, a, a flow before, uh, just no oil here. We just measured the distribution of velocities uh, before we uh, a flooded polymer, then we put something like 20 uh, pore volumes of the polymer solution. And you can see that we get a big change. There's no oil, but we get a huge change in the distribution of velocities. This is the difference here. And you can see, actually, if you look, you can see some places that the flow is actually in the opposite direction. It's really changed. And you go and you measure the permeability, just measure the direct permeability. You see that upon flowing just a few pore volumes, you get a huge reduction in the um, in the permeability, and that tells you that somehow some of the polymer must be absorbing to the surface. It's retained on the surface. You're changing the flow geometry. But how are you doing that? Well, here's the distribution of velocities before and after. Notice they're both exponential, but they're much broader. Just as we saw, they're much broader after after due to this uh, this change in the um, in the um, the, the retention of the polymer. So we can understand a little bit about what's going on. I won't go through the details. Normally you think that permeability depends on the uh, length squared. And you always think, at least, at least when I'm trying to understand permeability, I say it depends on the length squared. It's roughly the throat, the square of a typical throat size, particularly for a well-connected medium like uh, a porous medium. And so it, the permeability should scale just as the square of a dimension. The thing is, that's true, but there's another inherent direction, dimension because of the packing of the, of the pores. So you have a certain number of pores. If I model it just like a Poisson flow, a bunch of tubes, there's a packing that also depends on the dimension. And if you account for that, then the actual uh, behavior of the velocity should be like Poisson flow. And then the, the velocity depends on the, uh, the square root of the permeability, or the permeability spent, depends on... Um, on a dimension to the fourth power. So this suggests that if you have um, a fixed flow rate, the uh, velocities should scale as the inverse of the square root of the permeability. And in fact, if you go back and you scale the after data, the, the velocity distributions by the square root of the permeability, you actually see this. 
to try and understand the origin of this behavior, we worked with Ahmed and um, and uh, Ariel, who did some beautiful simulations. Ahmed did these simulations. He took a, a, a model of a network of uh, Poissoy tubes. He calculated the, uh, used a, essentially a Kirchhoff's law to, to calculate the flow using Poissoy, Poissoy flow in each of them. And then he started making the diameter smaller and smaller. He always gets a distribution of, um, a, 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 essentially an exponential distribution of the velocities, there's a little bit of a tail, but it's essentially exponential. They scale together and they scale exactly with the, uh, perm the square root of the permeability. But now we can go and we can measure the effective volume fraction and the actual volume fraction. The effective volume fraction is what you would get if you said, well, okay, the permeability has changed and the permeability scales inversely with porosity. So what, what's the, uh, what, what is the porosity that you would need and what is the actual porosity? And you see that as you start blocking the tubes, the actual, uh, the, the, the actual porosity is significantly higher than what you would get just from the expected porosity. And what that tells you is it's not a, uh, an effect. The absorption of the polymer is not due to the fact, it's not changing things because you're changing the uh, porosity of the medium. It must be because you're changing the, uh, the configuration, you're changing some pores, you're blocking pores. And that's what Ahmed did was if the pores got were very narrow as they filled up with polymer, he blocked them. And it's the change of the network structure that's leading to the change in the uh, permeability, the change in the flow rate. And so now you can go back and say, look, I have these this wide distribution of velocities. So the velocity that I can take to get my viscous forces I don't have to take my average velocity. I can take the very high velocities. And if I do that and I go back, now these are, these are done for, uh, these are uh, back to these uh, oil displacement in the presence of polymer, the experiments, but it's done with a real model system. So now I can ask, how can I change, how can I compare the actual flow of the, uh, the, the viscous forces to the capillary forces? And um, if I do the, if I, increase the average velocity after the polymer flood, and I ask what is the typical viscous force uh, in the experiment, it's still a couple of orders, or it's a, well over an order of magnitude small compared to the uh, capillary force of these remaining uh, ganglia. But the thing that I'm doing there is I'm only considering the average, and it's very heterogeneous. So there's some places where the actual velocity can be 10 times what it is in the oil. So here's an experiment where we did this completely with a model system so we can have trapped oils and we can see the different, um, we can see the different velocities. We have the average velocity, we have places where it's very slow and we have places where it's very high. And so now we go and ask, why do we get this extra oil recovery? What's happening with this oil recovery? And what's really happening, we can go and we, we can look, for example, here's a before and after where there's a small ganglion of oil that was trapped after the flow of the chase fluid, it's gone. And we can measure before and after the actual velocities of the fluid around the, the, to measure the viscous forces. And what you find is around that chase oil, around that uh, ganglion, that happened to be where the flow was really heterogeneous and the velocity got very large. And that's what caused that particular ganglion to uh, escape. And if you do the calculation, you find that's exactly consistent what we, with what we measure. We measure the capillary forces before where it's trapped, and then we measure the actual flow after the retention of the polymer, and it's now large enough that the um, uh, viscous forces and the capillary forces are comparable, and you can see why it would escape. So this tells you now that the real reason that uh, we think that a polymer enhanced oil recovery works is not because of changing the mobility ratio, but rather you're adjusting because of polymer tension, you're changing where the flow of the, uh, of the fluid uh, is going and you change the amount of fluid that's going, you're changing the, um, the uh, viscous forces because you're making it more heterogeneous as you block and change the different pores in this complex net network. So it's the conformance that's changed and oil, a new oil is released because you get high viscous forces near where oil was uh, retained, where oil uh, was, uh, residual oil existed before.
Okay, I think I have, um, I'm going to speak for another five minutes. I hope uh, that's okay, Hadi. Uh, that, that, would be, will... that would be perfectly fine. Even if six, seven would be okay. Yeah. Okay, good. I, I wanted just to tell you, uh, this is uh, this was a sampling of the sort of things that you can do with the um, with these model systems. Of course, uh, I, I we're, we're doing many other things now. We're actually using these model systems in a very beautiful way. You can go and actually study the behavior with real polymers and ask really what's going on. How do they actually behave? We're doing all of that. But I wanted to turn a bit to something else that we can do again taking advantage of using an index match system. Uh, this is a porous medium, but now it's a more solid porous medium, and we want to ask some questions. Can we some understand something about hydrofracking? Uh, of course, this is a very important um, uh, technological uh, in innovation, uh, which has qualitatively changed the way we, we recover oil and gas. Uh, it's, called, it's had tremendous geopolitical implications. Um, and we wanted to understand a little bit more about the nature of hydrofracking, taking advantage of our ability to make these transparent models. And now uh, we also then can take advantage of being able to use optical techniques to, to measure this. So what we do is we, we use, uh, go back here for a minute, we basically, we 3D print a uh, porous medium model. This is our 3D printer. It's uh, made of PMA. It's a relatively tough material, relatively stiff material. It's um, uh, elastic modulus is of the order of a few gigapascals, which is within a factor of 10 of what real rock is, but it's still a model system. And we uh, combine, uh, we, we inject uh, water from the top to do the fracking, and we look at the bottom and we use a very, very high speed camera to image the uh, propagation of this penny-like frac uh, uh, fracture. We put a little uh, starting point to allow the fracture to start in a penny-like uh, uh, shape. We measure, the, um, we measure the pressure. And our innovation is we also use uh, acoustic measurements uh, to measure the uh, sound that's emitted so that we can follow the, uh, the, um, the crack propagation, not only with optics, but also with acoustics. This is the way you would do it in the field, but now we can correlate the optics and the acoustics. So that's our ultimate goal. Uh, this is the kind of geometry. This is what it looks like. This is our sample. We have a ring. We need a lot of light. So our most recent incarnation has um, a ring of uh, diodes to give us a lot of light. Here you can see it. Uh, but we've been working on and refining these measurements over the last few months to try and learn something. Tomas Cochard is the person really doing it. And let me show you some of the things that you see, just to give you a hint of what you can see. These are four different samples. Of course, these experiments, you get a lot of data, but it takes a long time to do each sample because you can only do it once. You break the sample. But I'm going to show you now, uh, I'm going to start a movie. I'm going to play watching what the injection of water. And you can see they behave differently. But notice that sometimes you see this uh, crack lead the water by a lot. And eventually you get breakthrough. Eventually the water comes through. Let me look in more detail. And now I'm going to have uh, two rings that I'll follow the crack, the front of the crack and the fracture and the water. And you can see the red ring is the crack. It's always leading the fracture. Uh, the, sorry, the, the fracture is always leading the water. The water is always behind. In this case, it's more or less up to up. But in the other cases, you can see there's a big difference. The, the, um, the crack is always going faster than the water. So we can ask some simple things, for example, how fast does the crack go? What we think is happening is the crack moves quickly and then the water is much more viscous. It takes some time to, to uh, catch up. So if we take the sample and we break it apart after we're done the experiment uh, and we look carefully, you see these rough rings here. The water is coming this way. You see these rings, these perpendicular rings. And you look further down, you see a whole series of rings. And these rings are known as Wallner lines. And that always happens. That tells you that the speed of the, of the uh, propagation of the fracture is at the speed of the Rayleigh wave, the surface sound wave of, uh, uh, of this medium. And that's exactly what you should expect if it's going as fast as it can. So this suggests that the crack is moving very fast, but the water is taking time to catch up. 
here's just some early measurements of the uh, acoustics. And of course, if you can see the acoustics, this is just the, uh, uh, the detected signal here. If you see it, you can hear it. So I'm going to shut up for a minute. I'm going to play a fractal. I hope this plays. I hope you hear this. So that, sorry, that is actually the sound of a, of a fracture. Of course, it's downsampled. Just as we're downsampling the uh, speed, we're downsampling the uh, fracture. And we can do a lot more analysis. We're, we're working on it. Uh, the way you do this is you look at the, uh, uh, at the acoustic signal and the, you measure its uh, frequency spectrum. You do a running Fourier transform. We're starting to do this. Um, we're working a lot with Martin De Hoop, uh, in at Rice University, who's teaching us a lot about how to do these analysis. I won't talk about this anymore. Uh, this is all preliminary work. Uh, we have a lot more data, but this is just to show that uh, using these optical techniques, you really can uh, learn both uh, something about the uh, fracture uh, from visualization and from listening. And with that, let me stop and uh, take any questions. Wow, thank you very much for this inspiring lecture. I was absorbed to this story so we would be pleased to give you even 10 more minutes if you wanted to continue but thank you very much i see already many questions posted but i am sure many more will come sebastian please yes thank you very much dave for a great and absolutely fantastic talk and um so talk that you just wish it wouldn't end because it's so inspiring and so interesting to see fluid movements and the cracks moving um yeah Lots of questions already coming in, and please do continue everyone online um, to enter your questions. To start, the one from Christine, and from a very practical point of um, view, she thanks you for a really interesting talk. She wonders, you showed that the two-phase flow behavior changes dramatically depending on the flow rate, one or the other phase. How much can we rely on lab-based relative permeability measures than when we simulate flow in reservoirs? Uh, that's a good question. Um... Um, look, um, I think that um, these, these measurements are actually not the sort of way that we're going to answer that question. Um, the, the, the real answer of the question will come from how much can you trust the core measurements to the, um, to the measurements in the, in, the, in the reservoir. And this has always been the the knock on core level measurements that the scaling from from a core up to a reservoir involves many many assumptions you can never really uh, i think even now the best uh, reservoir simulators don't even get down to the level of the core so you have to somehow upscale everything and um i i don't think the measurements that we can do will tell you too much about the upscaling but what they will tell you is what the real physics is so that you can understand how to do the right kind of upscaling, how to do to, to, to develop the constitutive models. But I can't really tell you what the best models are. I don't think that uh, um, the measurements that we do will uh, provide that very, very important, uh, um, the answer to that very, very important question. Thank you. So the number of follow-up questions around your first phase diagram and Cyprian, um, Thanks you also for the talk. He's wondering how your um, plot of the capillary number for oil versus capillary number for water is different than the classical capillary versus viscosity ratio plots. Should they be the same? Yeah, they should be more or less the same. Exactly right. I mean, you just basically reproduce what you would expect. The difference is that now you can really measure it. You can understand it. You can see uh, exactly what's happening. And I think the most important thing that I would, the most important take home message for me, in fact, is that you can understand the effect of heterogeneity. You know it's there. Uh, you know somehow that heterogeneity is playing a role. Uh, you can sort of guess at it, but here you can really go in and look at it. And in fact, the, the take home message from, for, for my learning was that um, the heterogeneity is really where a lot of the action is. And that it's, you have to consider the, the distribution and the far ends of the distribution, that's where uh, a lot of the, the, the physics that occurs, a lot of the uh, phenomena that occur 
are being driven by the, the, the edges, of the ends of the, the heterogeneous distribution. Thank you. And Again, around the same plot, Martin Blunt, um, Dave, thank you, Dave, inspiring talk. Have you looked at the dynamics through energy balance equivalent to pressure? We've used it to reconcile your phase diagram with other data, different um, viscosity or mobility ratios and structure. Uh, the answer is no, Martin. And um, as always, you're way ahead of us. Uh, so um, I better uh, figure out what you're doing and uh, do what you're telling me to. Uh, this is not unusual. Uh, I should just figure out what you're doing and, and do it. So I will. Thank you. Uh, but we haven't done it yet. So if we're jumping back and forth here a little bit, questions are coming in really, really quickly. So I'm still trying to group them. Bill Rossen, um, again, saying great talk. You demonstrated polymer changes, residual oil saturation. Viscous fingering, the wavelength of the finger is important. Does the finger wavelength, is the finger wavelength much narrower than your apparatus? Um, the answer is uh, yes, it is. It is essentially uh, narrow. We certainly, uh, you know, it depends on the on the uh, mobility ratio and the details of the way we do it. But um, certainly, when we, I, I, I wasn't very clear. I apologize, but I did show two sort of classes of experiments. One was with real oil. That was where we tried to understand really what was going on. The second was with a model oil. The real oil, the viscosity ratio, the mobility ratio was enormous. It was like a thousand or something like that. And there, the um, the length scale of the fingers were very narrow, and you could see that clearly. You'd see large, uh, uh, well defined fingering. Um, the um, with the um, model oil, the, the mobility ratio wasn't wasn't as large. But still, we had uh, uh, the remnants of fingers, and so we could see that it was less. Uh, there, there's more oil recovery with the model with the model oil than there was with the uh, with the real oil. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you could still see the effects. They were all sufficient that uh, uh, the size of the medium was enough that you would get the viscous fingering in both cases. Thank you. Um, staying on the topic of um, fingering. Rasul, um, again, some great talk. I was wondering um, how we can characterize, I, characterize such a difference between the velocity of the stable front and the fingering front as a function of the capillary number. We use particle tracking the displaced phase. Um, yes, okay. So uh, I'm not sure I completely understand, but let me um, digress a bit um, and, and explain a little bit of this. Um, you can certainly uh, do this. Uh, I didn't show um, I didn't show any uh, velocity measurements as a function of capillary number. We certainly have done uh, residual oil as a function of capillary number. We've done that sort of thing. Um, but you're really asking, can we do, uh, or I think you're asking, one of the questions you're asking is, can we also do uh, velocity measurements um, in the residual oil itself, in the trapped oil? And the answer is yes. Um, uh, we had a former member of our, uh, of our group, Yaniv Ettery, who's now in Technion in, in Israel. Uh, and he, he is just finishing a paper, a, a beautiful paper where he did PIV, uh, both in the displacing fluid and in uh, the displaced fluid. And now you can really understand something about the flow of the ganglia even after you reach what's apparent steady state. And this becomes a very interesting story. You think you reach steady state and everything, you know, you, you put, I don't know, 80 or 100 pore volumes of the displacing fluid, and you still start seeing changes in the displaced fluid. And But now you can really go and you can look, you can do uh, PIV, you can do um, fluorescence recovery after photobleaching, FRAP, you can see the motion of the oil itself. And um, uh, then by uh, very careful uh, uh, studies of the, um, of the shape of this with, with confocal microscopy, what um, Yaniv has shown is that, in fact, even though you're at steady state, there still remains some thin films that connect the ganglia. And there's still some uh, viscous flow. It's very, very slow because it's going through these thin films 
but it's sufficient that over time, and this is over many, many, many pore volumes of the continuous fluid, uh, you will see some changes. You might call them Haynes jumps, uh, snap-off events. You'll see long-term dynamics of the, um, of the ganglia. And you can go in and look at them, and you can measure the velocities, and you can show that everything is really quite consistent with some slow flow of the, um, of the, uh, of the displaced fluid, of the resident fluid, uh, through the thin films, which you can start to find. And so many of the ganglia, even though they look like they're distinct, are connected by very, very thin films that run along the uh, surface of the interface. So that's a, a whole nother story. I didn't really touch on that. Um, we're just trying to finish up a paper uh, on that, but it's very clear that you can see that and it's an important uh, consideration. And that is one of the advantages of being able to do it with these index match fluids that you can look, uh, you can use PIV of the, uh, to look at the fluid flow in both phases. Right, thank you. Um, on the topic of PIV, Masamura, again, thank you for thanking you for the excellent talk. Um, he wonders, can the out-of-plane velocity profile also be measured with confocal PIV? Any problems with tracers sticking to the beads? Yeah, so the answer is, um, of course, there are problems with tracers sticking to the beads, and uh, we've uh, had to work very carefully to make the part of the, the, the particles very stable to prevent them from sticking to the beads. And we do that pretty well. Maybe there's some sticking, but it's pretty good. Um, and yes, we can measure out-of-plane velocity. I showed the out-of-plane velocity, which is the velocity normal to the flow direction, but it's still in the plane. If we want to measure the out-of-plane, we have to do a little bit more sophisticated analysis. There are ways you can do that. Um, we haven't really tried to do that in detail, but you can do that, say, by using the... Uh, the um, shape of the particles um, and the fact that uh, in, two, in two subsequent images, the, if they go out of plane, the focus of the particles and therefore their apparent size when you measure them will change. And you can do things like that. And from that, you can determine uh, the out of plane velocity. It's much more difficult, so we don't do that extensively, but I think we could do it uh, if we needed to. Thank also, you. I guess we have other optical techniques, which I didn't talk about, which are very good at measuring things like that, but that's a whole different story. Staying on the topic of 2D versus 3D, Julian uh, wonders, with the capability of doing 3D mi micromodels, have you been able to reproduce physics that you wouldn't have been able to see in um, a 2D single layer micromodels, the tradi more traditional micromodels? And the answer is, I think so, because, um, I think that um, the connectivity that you get, the fact that the, the, the displacing fluid can flow around uh, 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 a ganglion in all directions does make a difference. So I don't think that we would be able to reproduce exactly the same physics if we um, had a two-dimensional model. Certainly the relative flow would be different um, and um, the nature of the flow would be different. Uh, the distribution of velocities would be different. Um, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, I think it's quantitative, but uh, it's certainly qualitative. Uh, and certainly when we're doing tests with real polymers, which we do, um, we're much better off when we need to have this three-dimensional behavior for many of the tests that we do. So I think that really um, it's qualitatively uh, different um, going into the third dimension, even though we're imaging, as you point out, just in two dimensions. So most of our imaging, we, we can measure, and we often do measure the full three-dimensional image. I'm going to switch topics a little bit, and there's a question around um, your hydrofracturing experiments. Um, Vijita, and thank you, fantastic talk. In your hydrofracking um, hydrofracking fracturing, I guess, hydrofracking setup, the acoustic data acquired, um, the, the acoustic data is acquired in tomography setup. How would we use such acoustic data in the field? Um, yeah, okay. So we have, um, in fact, as you as you saw, that we, we, we have a tomographic setup. And the idea is ultimately to try and get the kind of information that you might be able to get in the field. In, in the field, the only way you're going to get information about fracture 
is by the Acoustic Commission. And there you can do a, 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 a true three-dimensional uh, imaging of that by having a series of seismic detectors in different locations and listening. We tried to mimic that, but our sample is still fairly limited. We have four detectors and we will look at uh, the correlation of, um, of um, the arrival of sound from the different detectors to try and detect where the crack is actually going. Uh, of course, the problem is we have a penny crack, so it's going in all directions. It does tend to go preferentially at first in one direction, so we think we can still learn something like that, uh, and we're trying to analyze the data as we speak. But that's exactly what we're trying to do. Wonderful. Um, back to the two-phase flow um, part of your talk. I'm just trying to find the right question. And also mindful of time, but there are a couple of really interesting questions I want to bring forward. Um, yeah, here it is. So, and Pop, again, thanking you for this interesting talk. Is the contact angle assumed to be constant in the experiment? If hysteretic effects or dynamic contact angles are included, how would this impact the balance between forces and velocities? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And um, uh, we measure the contact angle. We don't do... Um, we don't do dynamic measurements typically. We'll do just static measurements. Um, I think that um, that most of the effects that we're seeing, um, the dynamics come because uh, the wetting changes as you in, inject the different uh, fluids, and, and you expect that change of the uh, of the of the wetting uh, behavior. Uh, we see that. That's why we get these thin films that are, are left over. Even uh, in, we see that both in invasion and um, an imbibition, we see these thin films left over. Um, that must be due to changing wetting. Um, I think that in the steady state flow, things are slow enough that we don't have to worry about the real contact angle, but the actual dynamics we probably do. And we haven't tried to take that into account, but I think that there's no question that there are um, dynamic effects. Staying on the topic of dynamic effects for just another question, Asan, um, again, saying, great talk. How does the viscoelasticity of a polymer affect the local velocity field and capillary number? Um, I don't think it's that much. Um, it can change uh, dynamically. We work in the regime where, where our capillary numbers are low enough that we don't get elastic effects. We don't get elastic turbulence, that, that kind of effect. Um, we, we ensure that. And, you know, it may change if we go to really low capillary numbers, it may change, but these are pretty uh, sheer thinning, these uh, fluids. And so uh, I think of the capillary numbers that we uh, work at, the, um, the, the mobility is, if anything, lower uh, or higher. I mean, the, the ratio is worse. The, the, the viscosity of the fluid has even decreased a bit compared to um, the uh, zero shear rate. Wonderful. Um, so take two more questions because then we start running out of time. So one is in from one of our previous speakers, Majid Hassanizade. Given the intricate interactions between the two fluid phases, do you still think do you still think traditional two-phase Darcy is the correct macro scale, macro scale equation with rel terms being the only parameter? Question continues, the only parameter accounting for those intricate interactions. Or do we need something else beyond two-phase Darcy and relative permeabilities? I would say no. I mean, you're right. It's not the right way of looking at it. I think that's the real learning that we have is that you have to consider the um, heterogeneities and that they're really important. And um, I, don't, I don't have a better model, by the way. So you, know, <laughs> you could use the distribution and try and figure that out, but I don't, I've not tried to do anything other than simulation. And that's what uh, Ariel is doing. And, and that's also still a model. So I don't know. But I would say it's not the Darcy equation is not the right thing. Last but certainly not least, here's a question from Leila. Um, also, thank you for great talk. Could you please comment on how the knowledge of flow behaviors from oil and gas can be extended to other systems, for example, hydrogen storage? What would be the major differences? Well, I mean, it's uh, all of these things you have to worry about where it's important. You have to worry about the heterogeneity of the medium and the heterogeneity of the flow. And, what that has, what effect that has on the on the behavior, um, and um, I think that for sequestration, for example, it could be very important. Okay, thank you very much, Dave, for again for fantastic talk. Also, 
time take um, answer a lot of really good questions. Apologies to everyone in the audience if I couldn't bring your questions forward. Um, Hadi, over to you again. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I actually noticed our first year undergrad students were also typing questions. This this is really, really uh, great to see so many turnouts and, and even the first quarter bachelor students, uh, though being home and taking all lessons online are attending all these events. So well done, Anna and others whom I could detect here in the list. Uh, I would like to uh, take the chance to announce our next week's speaker is is Professor Sara Gasta from North in uh, Norway. Uh, Sara is going to speak about uh, evaluation of safe and sustainable CO2 storage at climate relevant scale. So uh, until next time, the same uh, time, 4 p.m. European, 3 uh, British, 7 a.m. California. Stay happy, healthy, tuned. And we see you next week with yet another geoscientific and geoenergetic talk. Stay safe and thanks very much, Dave. It was really fantastic. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.